We are going to get started with panel two. Uh, and this is a panel that really follows off of our first panel, uh, which gave us such a nice overview of the different definitions and approaches to NBS. So we will be following that. And by thinking about defining NBS, particularly solutions for whom, by whom, and for what. And so our speakers today are going to be talking about how NBS is resonating with different constituencies and stakeholders that they work with, and how these different definitions and approaches to NBS might resonate um, with these different communities. So we're going to be looking particularly at the social and the scientific and the political economic context of NBS. Um, we want to make sure that we meet those objectives that were laid out um, at COP26 last year that we've heard about already, the idea that um, NBS needs to build on strong human rights principles, it needs to strengthen justice, and it needs to safeguard healthy ecosystems. So we've got a great panel for you today. Um, we're going to have Angela Andrade. Um, we're going to have Matthias Bertram. Um, we have Beth Turner. Um, we have Marina Melendez, um, we have Helen Hugendat, and we have Hank Niebuhr. And we are all going to be listening to their presentations today, and then we'll have time um, for questions both from the online audience um, and folks here as well. Um, so the first speaker in our panel today is going to be Angela Andrade, who's going to be joining us um, online. And Angela is the Senior Climate Change and Biodiversity Policy Director at Conservation International Columbia, and she's chair of the Commission on Ecosystem Management of the IUCN. So during her career, she's had extensive experience in planning um, different aspects of environmental policy, as well as working on social and ecological studies as a researcher. Um, she's been involved in several global negotiations as a representative of the uh, IUCN and CI as well. Um, and she's been leading several important initiatives and involved with many others, um, including the IUCN Global Standard on NBS. So if we can get Angela on the call here. There we go. Angela, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this, in this panel. Uh, today, I will be presenting some discussions that have been raised in the international negotiation. And for some of us who have been working for years on the ecosystem approach, ecosystem-based approaches and nature-based solutions, we will look at the complementarities that exist um, among all these concepts and uh, how they are connected in the context and the scientific underpinning of some of them and how do they respond to different objectives. So the three of them are uh, really uh, the ecosystem approach, um, ecosystem-based approaches and nature-based solutions. For some of you, perhaps interesting to see that uh, in many negotiations, people say that nature-based solutions is the same, uh, the same thing that the ecosystem approach or ecosystem-based approaches. So we are going to discuss this uh, in this presentation. So important to see that the ecosystem approach was adopted by the Convention on Biological Diversity in the year 2000 as the main framework for action to achieve the main objectives of the convention. That is conservation of biodiversity, sustainable use of the components of biodiversity, and the fair and equitable, equitable sharing of the benefits. Arise, uh, arising out of the utilization of genetic resources. So, and this definition includes uh, 12 principles or elements that are um, important for the implementation. And some of the most important ones, of course, all are relevant, but in my view are the need to, to have a holistic approach, the uh, one that is related to ecosystem management, and of course, uh, to adaptive management, for, uh, sorry, and also the recognition that man and the and culture are part of ecosystems. So the ecosystem approach is not a substitute of previous approaches uh, to conservation, but recognizes the need for a wider approach because in those days, the classical approaches to conservation were extremely focused to species or to rarities, and they were mainly implementing protected areas. And in, in those days, the main topic was really to see what was what was happening in the ecosystem as, as um, 
uh, beyond the protected areas and beyond conservation. But um, such limitations included a failure to better understanding the structure and function of ecosystems and process providing um, goods and services for people. And important to recognize also that the ecosystem approach has um, as the basis the web of life um, and providing a better connection between nature and people and of course culture. Uh, well, the ecosystem approach is based on the application on, on scientific methodologies focused on the different levels of biological organizations the, uh, and also recognizes that humans are part integral part of the ecosystems, that natural and transformed ecosystems are complex, whose resilience depends on the systematic uh, relationship between species and their environment, the society and the culture, and the importance of including the socioeconomic environment and the linkages with traditional knowledge. Um, important also uh, to consider that, uh, in my view, some of the main um, inputs, uh, scientific inputs from the ecological science to the uh, adoption of the ecosystem approach is what we get from landscape ecology that it was considered one of the very first areas of knowledge that um, is transdisciplinary. And it, it's an area, it's um, very much related to system science and integrates biophysical and analytical approaches with a humanistic and holistic perspectives across the natural and social sciences. Uh, another important uh, topic to highlight here is that in those days, it was not clear uh, the definition of, of ecosystems um, at landscape level. So this is something that recently in the IUCN and the Commission on Ecosystem Management, we also developed the IUCN Global Ecosystem Typology that is based on ecosystem function and it's providing um, a global understanding of the main ecosystem types. And uh, the idea is to align different research and different activities um, um, regarding this uh, typology. Uh, later on, the ecosystem-based approaches and, and during the last decades, they have seen, we have seen extensive process in ecosystem science, uh, science and tools for ecosystem-based approaches for conservation. And uh, they refer to the integrated management of human activities based on the best, uh, the best available science about the ecosystem and its dynamics to identify and take action on influences which are critical for to achieve the sustainable use of the ecosystem, goods and services, and the maintenance of ecosystem integrity. It refers in general to sustaining ecosystem health, uh, obtaining and maximizing in the long term the socioeconomic benefits, and generating knowledge about the impact of human activities. Uh, that, um, and uh, we have many examples on the implementation of ecosystem-based approaches for water management, for conservation corridors, for biosphere reserves, and there are a lot of experiences all over the world. I want to highlight here is some of the most relevant ones related to the conventional biological diversity, and this is the adoption of ecosystem-based approaches uh, in the year 2009, that is uh, mainly related to climate change adaptation, and later on, the important contribution of the ECODIR R community that develop um, joint guidelines for the adoption of ecosystem-based approaches. But uh, these are uh, some of the ideas that were um, the basis for the development of the MBS standards. Some of them were already explained, but I want to highlight that one of the important topics is the recognition that all the problems that are creating the current challenges that we have and that are relevant at global level, national level, community level, landscape level, are completely interconnected. And uh, so the only way to, way to address them is um, in an integrated manner. Because if we don't do that, we will continue generating trade-offs. And uh, well, 
we don't have much time to solve all these crises that are affecting sustainability and also the integrity of the ecosystems. So these are some of the reasons. And um, we all know the global, um, uh, the SDGs that were adopted uh, by UN uh, in 2015, but these were some of the ones that we identify uh, as some of the most critical ones. And in my, in my view, the idea would be to address all of them in an integrated manner, even if the uh, IUCN standard uh, highlights that we need more than one or one um, global societal challenge well described, we need really to have more in my, in my view because otherwise we will be increasing the trade-off. Here, I want to highlight, not to repeat the definition of MBS, but highlight something that is being in discussion in several places now. I'm attending the IPBS plenary. And again and again, this topic uh, is coming back. That is the need to recognize uh, that nature really refers to the web of life, including people and it's their culture. So this is important because um, we are all interacting for many, many um, um, millions of years. And uh, so nowadays, uh, this is becoming something uh, quite relevant for understanding the problem and really addressing the solutions. Here, uh, we highlighted the work that was developed by Emmanuel Sasham and a group of us who were uh, working in the development of the principles and the, and the document, the first document that was published by IUCN on NBS. And uh, some of the principles that are specific, and I think they are quite relevant, is the one that relates, refers to the synergies, the one that relates to the landscape scale. And in this case, the, what I mentioned about the relevance of landscape ecology, every time I see that it's more and more critical. And the one that refers to policy integration, this is, these are topics that are extremely important. So when we talk about nature and, and culture, we have um, examples from the Amazon, for example, in Colombia, where you see that the connection between the um, uh, human activities in the Amazon and the full web of life are, are clear and people can understand them very well. But if you go to other areas like uh, where I live, the city of Bogota that is surrounded, sur surrounded by high mountains uh, located in the Eastern part above uh, 2,600 meters and the higher part is above uh, 4,000 meters. And we, the city depends entirely on the services provided by those areas. So the complexity is, is increasing every time and we need to keep that in mind because otherwise the way we solve this problem is not really enough. So you see here the connections between the principles and the main criteria that were uh, defined for the global standard that it was presented earlier. Important that we need to address all of them in an integrated manner. This is the, the only way really to make sure that we are really achieving the, the, all the goals in an integrated manner. And just to finalize, I wanted to, to discuss or to leave some messages that is the current role of nature-based solutions for um, really contributing to the transformational change that, that is needed. So we are moving from the conservation interventions that I, I mentioned at the beginning and, and the ecosystem approach, it's the basis for that. And it's mainly focused on, on the conservation agenda, but by the, the scientific framework that is being adopted by the MBS standard. And, and we are moving towards the sustainable development agenda. It's also based on transdisciplinary knowledge and knowledge co-creation. That's also a, a, a very important. And this is something that we see every day more and more. We are also um, aiming to understand multiple values of nature and culture, uh, include, uh, and some of the criteria make reference to the safeguarding nature. So these days there are new concepts that are also interconnected that they are re uh, related to nature positive solutions by the recipe net gains, also safeguarding society, uh, the importance of the high quality interventions that was also mentioned this morning, 
uh, the need to really rethink finance value and make sure that they, we are reducing the externalities, the relevance of identifying synergies and trade-offs, and the importance to provide the best approach to transition to a low carbon future and avoid the potential perverse impacts. So the, the next step is really to make sure that uh, MBS contribute to the big transformational changes that we need to address. And this, that's it. So thank you very much. Um, I will end with, with this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. Our next speaker is Matthias Bertram. Um, so Matthias is an advisor in the GIZ Division of Environment, Climate Change and Infrastructure, um, supporting the German Federal Ministry for Environment in the CBD negotiations going on right now, um, with a particular focus on that post-2020 um, global biodiversity framework um, and how nature-based solutions fits into all of this. So his background is in international forest management. And for the last 15 years, his work has been focused on these areas and related topics like ecosystem-based adaptation and disaster risk reduction, uh, with a regional focus on Southeast Asia and Latin America. And he's also a member of the IUCN International Standard Committee for the Global um, NBS Standard. And I forgot to mention at the beginning that this panel is sponsored by IUCN. So thanks very much, and I'll turn it over to Matthias. Yes, thank you very much, Pam. And uh, I hope you can hear me. In the back as well. Okay, great. Thank you. And it's indeed an honor and pleasure to, to be here. So thank you very much also to the, to the organizers. This Natural uh, History Museum is, is truly, for me, it's a very inspirational place. Also, I compared a bit to the museum in Berlin, in Germany, which just a couple of weeks ago, a group of scientists, they um, declared a, a Berlin declaration on stepping up for biodiversity in nature. And one uh, declaration item is also to step up nature-based solutions. And this was addressed to the G7 presidency that Germany is currently um, uh, hosting. And luckily also in the leaders uh, declaration, this, um, this, the message was heard and nature-based solution is in the, in the document, which is, which is very happy uh, for us all, I think. Um, but now I would like to um, look a little bit in the um, biodiversity community in the CBD, adding to what uh, already the executive secretary Elizabeth Naruma Rima has, has mentioned um, this morning in the first session and also building on uh, Anfela's presentation um, because I think we all realize that the time might be there for integrating nature-based solutions in multilateral environmental agreements, the Rio conventions. We have seen first successes under the CCD in Abidjan, as Stuart mentioned this already. So we see that change, but we are not, we are not there yet. We are on the way. And um, so just what uh, what we as a team also together with colleagues from IISD Canada and also the Environmental Research Center in, in Leipzig, Helmholtz, we analyzed a little bit the synergies between biodiversity and climate change and we also came up with some key messages which already resonate well with the discussions here. But now jumping a little bit into the negotiations and this was already mentioned uh, 10 days ago, uh, we had the negotiations for the global biodiversity framework in in Nairobi, and what you can see here is a typical situation at a very late time of the day or night, uh, people are huddling together, and we realized that nature-based solution, uh, well, not only in the CBD negotiations, as we all know, uh, but in others, they are supported by many, and this is my personal observation as being part of the German delegation, uh, but they are also contested by others, and the question is why, and there's certainly no simple answer for that, and there are multiple answers for that, depending on who you ask. But one element, and this was already raised um, a couple of times uh, today, is, uh, well, there is a long history of, of other concepts which have been well established under the CBD. And um, so the ecosystem approach was, was mentioned as an underlying foundation. Um, uh, Angela already referred to the definition. Uh, so just to reflect a little bit on the timeline that we have now moving back half of my age, I would say 22 years, and going back to the, to the CBD um, uh, COP in, uh, in, in Kenya, where the ecosystem, uh, uh, ecosystem approach was, was coined as an, as an integrated strategy for integrated land and water management with 12 principles. Um, so this was really the, the foundation back then. 
And also at that time, um, there was a clear look into what climate change means as a driver for biodiversity loss. An ad hoc technical expert group was found to look into the synergies also to inform the climate change convention. And then finally in, um, in 2009, the definition of ecosystem-based adaptation, we have heard it a lot today, uh, was created by um, this working group um, as a strategy to adapt to climate change by using biodiversity. So um, this was already quite well um, established and uh, this is why many people in the biodiversity community, they are very much looking of course into these concepts and we know that they are now part of the bigger family of nature-based solutions. And then also at, uh, in 2010, where the last strategic plan for biodiversity, the Aichi targets have been, have been set up, um, there was a lot of work on ecosystem-based approaches for adaptation and mitigation, looking into the toolboxes, into the, into the concepts also related to, to RED or RED plus under the Climate Change Convention. And also um, the Rio Convention's pavilion started to create an interface between biodiversity, climate change, and also the uh, UNCCD. And there are also topics like nature-based solutions were already high up on the agenda. So this is in fact very promising to see and looking back what already has been achieved. Um, and then finally in, in 2014 at the COP12 in, uh, in uh, Korea, uh, there was a lot of discussion and the decision also on biodiversity on climate change dealing with ecosystem-based approaches for um, adaptation and disaster risk reduction, which ultimately um, led to the setup of, of technical reports, technical series based on practitioners' knowledge, based on scientific evidence that ultimately led to the adoption of the voluntary guidelines for ecosystem-based adaptation and disaster risk reduction at um, the COP14 in, in Sharm el-Sheikh, um, Egypt. But this was not, only, well, it was not the only um, element. Uh, the guidelines, they contain principles and safeguards. I think these are words we heard already a lot today to respect or to ensure social and environmental safeguards. It's mentioned in the UNIA resolution. So um, again, this is a very important basis for that one. Um, and also in Sharm el-Sheikh, so the so-called Sharm el-Sheikh to Kunming action agenda uh, for nature and people has been established by the Egyptian presidency, which is now the incoming presidency for the, for the climate COP. And it's quite interesting to see in this um, action agenda, it has three objectives and one objective is to step up and implement nature-based solutions. So nature-based solution might not be integrated in the CBD decision text so far, but it is referred to in this action agenda, but also in the voluntary guidelines for ecosystem-based approaches for adaptation and disaster risk reduction. So the linkage is there and this is why this is also recognized, for instance, in, t in 2020 by uh, the first biodiversity summit under the uh, UN assembly, where also the leaders pledge for nature um, was, was set up. And then thanks to, to UK for being very strong on that, uh, this leaders pledge for, for nature really calls for staying up, stepping up action, finance for biodiversity and nature. And this also includes uh, nature-based solutions and to mobilize resources. So the political momentum is really there. And uh, under the CBD negotiations, the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People is also very active and also Lord Goldsmith in his opening remarks today, he also mentioned this High Ambition Group, um, 100 countries um, who are really supporting the so-called 30 by 30 uh, targets uh, to protect 30% of land and seas at least by 2030. So very ambitious. And this of course had very, has very positive implications on nature-based solutions once we have ad adopted what Lord Goldsmith called today also the Paris, the Paris Agreement for Nature, hopefully at the end of uh, this year in uh, Montreal at the COP15. So this is where the pathway um, is leading us. It's very promising to see the UNEA resolution being adopted. Um, we all realize this was also a hard uh, struggle and I think Andrea Ledward mentioned it already it is very hard to bring more than 190 countries together to agree on, on something because there are concerns by others, but also opportunities by others. And let me take a little, a little bit the opportunities that many from the biodiversity perspective who are supporting nature-based solution, what they, what they see. It is a very holistic problem-solving approach. I think Stuart referred to it, it's the action part. I think 
he mentioned it in his presentation, the action was red. So it's about action. It's not only a strategy, it's not only enabling conditions, it's really action on the ground. So this is what to many people, pol pol policymakers, decision makers, practitioners and scientists is very appealing. It's, it's really problem oriented. It brings together the different um, Rio conventions. The Agenda 2030, which is also mentioned in the uh, UNEA resolution, it's nature-based solutions for sustainable development. So this is quite convincing. And I, I personally like the IUCN picture um, of this because this is a holistic picture which brings very different good aspects here um, together. Then on policies and, and plans, it's really now the time, and I think Natalie mentioned more than 100 NDCs, they contain nature-based solutions, maybe to certain degrees in quality, some are more explicit, others less, but it's, it's a process, it's about uh, stepping up um, efforts, ambition, also clarity, and also under the CBD, the revision of the National Biodiversity Strategic Action Plans, the NBSUBS, is, is coming up once the agreement, the Global Biodiversity Framework is there, and we also see it under the revision of, of the NUPS, where this uh, topic is very important. Then of, on finance, we heard it a lot, we need uh, additional new funds from public, private, from all sources, national, domestic, uh, but also phasing out the harmful in incentives. So there's a big, big opportunity to have joint financing. Uh, on action, it's a very transformative and systemic approach. I personally like also this picture by, from the IPES, um, IPCC uh, report, which really looks into the ecosystem's perspective, but also the landscape or seascape, or which is called scape perspective. Um, so having really a holistic model, addressing the various issues, addressing the society challenges, uh, including biodiversity loss um, at, at all scales, not only in protected areas, but going beyond, not only OECMs, but going beyond into the entire planet. If we want to protect 30% of the planet, we have to make sure that we also treat the other 30 per, uh, 70% in, an, in a good manner. And then finally, communication and uh, awareness raising. And I hope the Guardian forgives me for taking this, this picture. I like it very much because it's very appealing. Protection, restoration, funding, it's, this brings it to the point. So nature-based solutions, it, has, it is a great communication tool, especially if you talk to people outside the green sector, if you talk to infrastructure uh, planners, city planners, um, uh, people from agriculture, etc. cetera. Um, it, it's quite appealing. So these are, um, and it, it's a good mainstreaming tool. It really helps to step out the biodiversity community, which has a certain size, but honestly is quite small compared to other communities. It helps to integrate and really to build upon various other established concepts. If we talk to city planners, they know green infrastructure. If we talk to um, rural developers, they will be more, more looking into forest landscape restoration and other topics. And this is all under one, well, I wouldn't call it umbrella, but it's all, in, it's all part of, of a bigger, bigger picture. Um, but as there are opportunities, this is what I heard a lot in the corridors of the negotiations and in other events. Of course, there are concerns and they have been already mentioned uh, today by various speakers. There is the risk and concern of a an, of an, uh, misuse of carbon uh, offsetting options by nature, that we do not step up our action on uh, net zero, um, that the topic is pushed by the climate community, because as, as you've seen the biodiversity community, they have talked for, for decades about ecosystem-based approaches. So many also think, what is now the added value? This is what some people uh, fear. It's about also uh, the uh, fear of not addressing the, the, the tipping points and trade-offs that we heard today, um, that there is a lack of adequate, uh, adequate uh, stakeholder and rights holder um, involvement in the whole process from the design to the implementation and receiving the benefits, uh, the risk of privatization and commodification of nature. And this is truly a balancing act to put the value to nature without commodifying it. Uh, so um, the question of marginalization, and today I also learned about green uh, gentrification in, in urban uh, areas, which of course is a, is a risk that needs to be addressed. And uh, that there is not a clear reference, or this is what others say, to a fair and equitable sharing of benefits, that some um, benefit, but not all, or not those who should benefit. 
And then, um, since a lot of um, discussion is focusing on forests, and I myself, I studied forestry, so I'm a big fan of forests, some fear it's a tyranny of trees that comes uh, upon us, that the focus is on forest ecosystems or restoration only, or restoration by trees, maybe in the wrong ecosystems, planting mangroves in seagrass beds, or planting monoculture plantations, and uh, to neglect conservation. So this is why uh, the key pillars that have been mentioned to today by Manuel or by, by Stuart and, and Angela, the, the NBS standard is, uh, is a good tool to, to address that. Um, and then also a lack of adequate monitoring, that a lot of the current monitoring is focusing on single benefits, carbon as one example. Well, also looking more at the practical side, I know it is challenging to monitor all benefits or even measure all, all benefits. The question is if we need that, but there is the concern that monitoring is focusing only on one or two or three uh, specific units or, or benefits. And that there is a, a broadness or weightness of the concept compared to, to others. Well, you could say it's a benefit that nature-based solution is very inclusive. It covers many concepts, but others say um, this might oversimplify things. Some fear that uh, concepts like, like BACs, for instance, or even ocean fertilization, geoengineering processes, they are included under the umbrella of nature-based solutions. And that there are no uh, links with existing approaches. Where the last one I cannot really fully understand because also what Angela mentioned, there's a clear linkage between the concepts. And this, for, this is for very good, good reasons because also the definition of nature-based solutions as um, under IONEA, which builds on IUCN and other work, it is rooted in the ecosystem approach and ecosystem-based approaches. So what we did, and we are not the first one to, to do so, this has been also inspired by the great work of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network and Youth for Nature. And I think Marina, she's also in, in the line. So um, this is comparing uh, in detail the ecosystem-based approach, which is, which is 12 principles, uh, with the nature-based solution global standard. And the color code already shows there are clear linkages. Do not be confused with, with all the lines now popping up, but it shows the complexity, how things are related. Uh, and, and there could be even, even more lines between the two. It, it shows a clear picture that, of course, the work of the nature-based solution standard is based on the ecosystem approach, which is contested by some, but looking into it, um, it's, it's not really <laughs> easy to, to comprehend why there shouldn't be any linkage. The linkages are there, um, and they are very explicit when it comes to addressing many societal challenges, looking into the scale, looking into economic and non-economic benefits, looking into change management or adaptive management, and even down to, uh, to mainstreaming. However, well, some elements are a bit different, and Manuel mentioned it, they are not the same, they are complementary. But I think this is a positive message that they are really, the, these concepts are really complementary. I, and I wish we could uh, focus less on discussion of terms and more going into the action, that's my personal opinion. However, what is a strong case for the uh, nature-based solution standard, in my opinion, is it really looks into the societal challenges, what Manuel this morning mentioned as the number one pillar. So this is quite explicit um, under nature-based solutions uh, standard. And also the sustainable, uh, being sustainable and being mainstreamed into other policies, plans, programs, strategies. This is very explicit and to me this is a this is a step uh, forward, but it builds on the ecosystem approach, which is very clear on finding a balance between conservation and sustainable use and manage ecosystems within their, their functioning. So I think the two, they, they come together quite, quite nicely and, and to me also perfectly. So what is, what is, what is needed? Um, well, of course, more, more trust building is, is needed among, among policy makers, planners, and practitioners, and I sincerely hope that, that this will also happen uh, prior to the, the CBD COP15 uh, in, in Montreal. Trust building is, is needed to, to make sure that these are not exclusive, but really complementary approaches. Um, but in order to do so, it's, it's, not, it's not only about agreeing that 
these terms are related. And in fact, UNIA does it. it. It finds a very elegant language that nature-based solutions is cognizant of and in harmony with ecosystem-based approaches. This is, this is good language. No, it's about ensuring the quality. It's about credibility and a clear scope of nature-based solutions. And this needs to be done by finally opera operationalizing this very young uh, definition that has been adopted uh, under UNIA. So to really to bring it in action, but, and this is very important, not to start the exercise of principles, criteria, etc. again, but really building on what has been achieved in the last decades, applied concepts, safeguards, which are existing under the CBD, under the UNFCCC, we have safeguards which are used by the multilateral development banks and so on, and also safeguards which apply to indigenous peoples and local communities. Uh, use that, use the criteria like the IUCN standard uh, to really to make it happen on the ground, but be, be clear what is not a nature-based solution. And this is clearly, I can speak for the German government, I'm not here for the German government, but this is uh, backs and ocean fertilization, they are not part of nature-based solutions. So we could have an academic debate on this, but when it comes down to those practical examples, I think it's, it's very important, it is very clear what it needs to be very clear what, what is a nature-based solution and, and what not. Then when it comes to planning and, and implementing nature-based solutions, it's important to do it with, by, and for people. And I, I think this resonates very well with the, I think they're called guiding principles by the Nature-Based Solution in Initiative. I think there are four of them. So I think this is one of, one of them. This is what we hear uh, from, from many, many actors. It's about empowerment. It's about engaging local people. It's securing land rights which often are violated, as we know, and this is a big discussion also in the CBD negotiations. It's about ensuring decision-making, showing that the own actions matters, because in the end, the people on the ground, they are the stewards of the land, they are the stewards of biodiversity. And it's about the opera opera operationalization of core principles, social, inclusive, and rights-based um, approaches. Uh, also, when it comes to benefit sharing, on, and also when it comes to adaptive management. And keeping also the dual role of biodiversity in mind, in mind. So biodiversity, it's not only a means to an end, it's the means and the end. It's, it's really, it's addressing social challenges. Um, it's the mean for that, but this is not enough. It's, and I think Manuel referred to it at, at the second, it's the second pillar. It's about the biodiversity benefits. It's about the net gain. Personally, I'm not so but big, big fan of the word net or net loss, but it's about biodiversity benefits um, as a key outcome, um, really to maintain ecosystem and increase, not only maintain, but increase ecosystem um, integrity and find the right balance between conservation, restoration and sustainable use. And then also better evaluate the full range of benefits. I think this is what we have heard already a lot today to value nature. It's not only about the GDP, it's not only about monetary benefits. So cost benefit analysis might not be the best tool, but you really need to go beyond carbon and, and single benefits and, and measure or value. I think this is more important to value uh, what matters. And this is according to the UNEA resolution. It's about well being, it's about ecosystem services, resilience and um, not forget biodiversity. So this is really key. Um, yeah, so I think this would be all from my side. Um, you'll find a lot more of uh, insights in uh, the a series of six thematic papers that we um, as a team from GIZ, IISD and UFZ have set up. It looks into the negotiation perspective, the science perspective, and also the practical implementation perspective into governance, multi-sectoral co collaboration when it comes to making use of, of synergies. And um, yeah, thank you. Some, some people reviewed the, the papers who are also here in the room. Thank you very much for this. And uh, thank you very much for your intention. Great, thank you. Any quick clarifying questions before we move on to the next speaker? Great, if not, our next speaker will be Beth Turner. Um, Beth is a researcher with expertise in ecology, biodiversity, and socio-ecological systems. For the past several years, she's been part of the Nature-Based Solutions Initiative here, researching the role of nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation 
and other development goals. She's also currently pursuing her doctoral studies at the University of Quebec in Montreal in Canada, investigating how community-led forest management can promote climate resilience of forests and local forest-dependent communities. So thank you and welcome, Beth. Over to you. Great. All right. So um, today I'm going to be talking about why we need to think of nature-based solutions as an interdependent system between people and nature. Okay, so um, there's rising concerns uh, that we've already heard today um, that nature-based solutions are being th thought of in ways that separate people from nature and that are more reducing nature to an instrumental tool that provides benefits to people. And there's numerous problems with such a framing. But one is that it fundamentally limits our understanding of how nature-based solutions work um, in order to provide the, the benefits they're tutored to provide and what makes them effective or not. Because rather than nature on its own providing these benefits to people, there's a breadth of work showing that it's, um, they're actually co-produced by people interacting with nature. And that's why, alternatively, um, uh, nature-based solutions are being promoted as facilitating a reciprocal partnership between people and nature. In other words, they are part of a social ecological system where humans and nature are interdependent and fundamentally inseparable. And the need to think of nature-based solutions in this way is particularly necessary in order to understand how they will re remain effective into the long term. Um, and this was the focus of recent research we've just finished and will be the focus of the rest of my talk. So we know that nature-based solutions are going to face and are already facing numerous threats from climate change and other global stressors. And so in order for them to be effective into the long term, they need to be able to navigate these changes and respond to these changes. In other words, they must be resilient. And so we argue that for nature-based solutions, this means that its social ecological system has to be resilient. So the whole system has to have the capacity uh, to continue functioning in the face of these, uh, these stressors. And so this um, area of social ecological resi resilience has been a um, subject of a much broader area of research that we can draw on for the nature-based solutions context. So we adopted uh, previous frameworks of social ecological resilience to show how this works, uh, which is shown uh, in this figure here. So first we have the local social ecological system um, that the nature-based solution is embedded in, which is represented by that outer blue box. And now while promoting resilience can be a formidable challenge, there are certain um, elements or mechanisms within the social ecological system that we can promote to, um, uh, that help build resilience. And nature-based solutions can affect these mechanisms through their implementation and management. And that's shown by the inner dashed box. Now, some of these mechanisms act more in the social aspects, some more in the ecological, which are shown in 1A, uh, and others act more in the local governance or decision-making process of the nature-based solution, which is 1B. And then, um, alone or through their interactions, these, uh, these mechanisms ensure that the entire system can continue functioning uh, in the face of these various threats uh, to provide the desired outcomes of, of a nature-based solution, be it um, you know, uh, food and water security, protection from floods and storms, storing carbon, biodiversity um, outcomes. And what's more is that harnessing those benefits themselves can feed back to affect those underlying mechanisms that underpin them. And this could be a positive feedback, but it could also be negative. And I'm gonna return later with some examples to show how this whole process really works. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna go, I wanna go back to uh, thinking about these resilience mechanisms because this is really the entry point in which we can think about how nature-based solutions can support uh, resilience. And so there's been a lot of research over decades to really try to find out what these mechanisms are, followed by work to consolidate into which ones are the most important. So we built off those consolidation efforts to come up with a typology of mechanisms that could be important for nature-based solutions. Um, and this is shown in this table here. And um, I'm not going to go into all of them, and I don't want you to read all of them right now either. 
uh, just to highlight that there's a lot of different things that we need to think about. Um, but a few examples include the inclusion of local and indigenous knowledge and decision-making process, um, local empowerment, and promoting species functional diversity. And we see a lot of these different factors being promoted in other discourses on nature-based solutions. We've already heard these things being talked about today. And so here we're showing the importance of them for ensuring that, that nature-based solutions can be, can be able to respond to changes and be effective long-term. So in order to see how nature-based solutions are affecting these mechanisms to support resilience, we applied the framework to a global data set of uh, peer-reviewed studies on nature-based solutions. But to narrow the scope, uh, we focus on nature-based solutions in forests. Sorry if I'm perpetuating the idea that nature-based solutions are forests. That was not our intent. Um, but and we also focused on only those uh, being implemented um, to help people adapt to climate change. And so I'm not going to go in. So these are some of our results, and I'm not going to go into the details. Um, but one of the um, uh, overall, though, we see that nature-based solutions do, are influencing a lot of these different mechanisms. And predominantly, we did find them to be uh, reported to be positive effects on these mechanisms. And so on the left, we see effects on more social mechanisms, and on the right, uh, the right graph, more ecological. And we see this predominance of positive effects shown in the dark blue bars uh, versus other types of outcomes, such as the negatives, which were the, the orange bars. But really, the, over, um, the overarching messages are the fact that we see nature-based solutions have the potential to affect um, elements across the social ecological system. So they're just as much about supporting the local people in a given place as they are about working with the nature that those people are part of. And also we see the, um, the capacity for nature-based solutions to affect these underlying ecological pr uh, properties. And so it's not just about taking benefits from nature, but they do have the potential of um, contributing back to that ecosystem stewardship and promoting ecosystem health. And then next, though, thinking about how nature-based solutions influence these mechanisms, it's actually by um, they facilitate the interactions between the mechanisms, including between the social and the ecological, which is why we really need to think of them as a partnership between people and nature. Um, and to, to get an idea of what I mean by this, I'm going to go back to our framework with some examples we found from our review to show how this works. So our first example is from Spain in a native chestnut forest. And so we saw by uh, supporting local land rights, uh, which is a social mechanism, ensured a decentralized autonomous uh, governance structure and the inclusion of traditional knowledge in the decision-making process. So those are two governance mechanisms. And this ensured the application of traditional fire management in the form of assisted, um, sorry, prescribed burning. And this maintained the forest structure in a state that was more resistant to wildfires. Um, this is an ecological mechanism. And so altogether, these um, uh, enabled the system to navigate wildfire risks. So wildfires were less frequent um, and intense when they did occur. And this ensured the continued functioning of the nature-based solution. Um, uh, and one relevant outcome was the continued production of the chestnut harvest, which was an important um, source of local income. And then another example we see is from a community forest in Nepal. Uh, and it was found uh, uh, by including local values in the decision-making process ensured that a diversity of, species, of tree species were planted because people used these different species for different purposes. And now these different species responded differently to various disturbances, which we call a, a response diversity. And this uh, ensured the forest could continue functioning in the face of a range of disturbances, such as droughts, fires, pest attacks, because at least some species were present that could tolerate them. And then the next uh, examples I'm going to uh, talk about or going back to this idea that harnessing a particular uh, any benefits from nature-based solutions can feed back to affect those underlying mechanisms that support it. So it's really a circular process. 
Um, and we found examples from forest restoration where we see the increased livelihood benefits uh, generated from the restored forests increase people's appreciation and respect to the forest, which increased the level of care and stewardship they showed it, um, increasing those uh, ecological resilience mechanisms through time. Um, and that also increased uh, um, attachment to place, which is a social mechanism. Um, on the other hand, extracting too many forest products can degrade those ecological resilience mechanisms, jeopardizing their uh, production in the future. And so really what these examples show um, is the need to really, in order to properly understand how nature-based solutions can be resilient and navigate changes, we really need to think of them more holistically. We need to think of the interactions between the social and the ecological, and we need to think about these feedbacks um, uh, and really promote this reciprocity between human and non-human nature. Um, and uh, yeah, and so we see the need for this in research to better understand uh, how we should be promoting nature-based solutions to support resilience. And we also need it in practice when we're thinking of designing and implementing nature-based solutions on the ground. And then, although I did focus on uh, forest-based adaptation strategies, we see similar lessons emerging from other nature-based solution contexts. And we're also seeing a breadth of relevant evidence embedded in many communities across the world. And this brings me to a final point that this idea of human nature reciprocity is not new, stemming from the nature-based solutions concept, but it's really been ingrained in the lives and values of many uh, people throughout history, notably many indigenous peoples. And so really one of the best ways forward for nature-based solutions to embrace this concept is by learning from and supporting uh, such communities where that wisdom is really still very much ingrained. And that's, I'll conclude there. Thank you. We'll move on to our next speaker who's joining us virtually and that is Marina Milanidis. She is a climate justice activist, a youth mobilizer, a social scientist, and a Greek Canadian settler based in what is currently called Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. She has over a decade of experience in youth climate activism and is the founder and development director of Youth for Nature. Marina holds an MSc from the University of British Columbia, where her work concerns narratives and perceptions of nature-based solutions and how we can better foster holistic conservation models that work for climate, nature, and people. So Marina, I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Pam. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, really, uh, really sorry to not be there in person today, but I also wanted to just take a second to thank the conference organizers for providing a hybrid format for this conference. I know that it can be kind of challenging and there's often technical issues when you do something hybrid, but it really does make it more inclusive. So just wanted to provide a little bit of a thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Yeah, my name's Marina. Thanks for that intro, Pam. Um, and as, uh, as Pam was noting, I come to the nature-based solutions space both as a scholar uh, who specializes in social science and in qualitative metrics, but also as a youth activist. And I've been really engaging in the NBS space since 2018 in both of those capacities and, and bring both of those perspectives into my work. And today I'm, I want to explore the range of narratives that, that are associated with nature-based solutions, specifically in global governance, uh, and what that means more broadly for inclusion and transformative change. So first, like, why are we talking about narratives? Um, narratives matter and do political work in really concrete ways. Uh, they shape how we understand what the problem is, what the threats are, and therefore how we understand what the solution to those problems are and who the stewards of that solution should be. Uh, and narratives are rooted in very particular value systems and and knowledges, and therefore often determine whose knowledges matter. 
uh, in solving a problem and, and, and doing that shape the inclusion and the exclusion of various actors and their worldviews in policy and practice. So there's some really real implications from narratives for participation in decision-making. I, uh, in, in doing my master's thesis, I, I realized that there wasn't a lot of work in narratives around nature-based solutions when I think that uh, the narratives around this idea have, have been really uh, influential in, in, in shaping how folks are understanding and also the, the progress that this term is able to make in broader policy and practice. So I wanted to take the opportunity to gather some empirical evidence to help start characterizing narratives around nature-based solutions. Uh, and that's what we'll be discussing today. So I'm gonna do my best to answer these three questions in 10 minutes. <laughs> First, what are the dominant narratives surrounding nature-based solutions? Uh, and what do those narratives tell us about participation and inclusion in nature-based solutions discourses more broadly? And lastly, how can we maybe frame nature-based solutions as a concept in ways that better support calls for transformative change? So let's start with the first question. What are the dominant narratives surrounding nature-based solutions? Uh, to try to answer this question, I did a narrative analysis using a discourse coalition approach and, and focused, bounded my inquiry on uh, global climate governance um, as a case study. And in doing that, found two competing narratives uh, characterizing uh, nature-based solutions discourses more broadly. The first uh, I called leveraging the power of nature. This was by far the dominant nature-based solutions narrative uh, that I found. Um, and its main message is that nature-based solutions are multifunctional, they're powerful, and they must play a critical role in addressing global challenges, especially climate change. This narrative is held by proponents of the idea of nature-based solutions, which largely consists of actors such as international organizations, large environmental NGOs, national governments, and the private sector. I would note that this is also the narrative that I've been hearing so far for the most part in a lot of the chats and the talks that we've been um, able to enjoy. There's another narrative though, the alternative narrative. Um, and this uh, I call dangerous distraction. So the key message that this narrative is putting forth is that nature-based solutions are being co-opted as a means to continue with what is seen as the unsustainable and unjust status quo. This narrative was largely held by critics of the idea of nature-based solutions, which largely consisted of actors such as local and indigenous organizations and organizations and collectives that explicitly identify themselves as being justice oriented So those two narratives, uh, what do they tell us more broadly about participation and inclusion? Something that these, we can see from these narratives are the way that they are reflecting and reproducing existing fault lines in global environmental governance, uh, where the actors that align themselves with the leveraging the power of nature narrative tend to be actors that have more access to decision-making and who operate within and in at least some way benefit from status quo power dynamics. Whereas actors that align themselves and are contributing to the dangerous distraction narrative tend to be actors who have historically been excluded from decision-making and denied access to the status quo power. And because the leveraging the power of nature narrative is the dominant narrative, uh, is dominant across the discourse, that tells us that nature-based solutions discourses as they're currently being characterized by these narratives are right now serving and centering those who already hold power uh, and are not those that are on the front lines of biodiversity loss and climate crisis. This suggests that nature-based solutions as the concept is currently being characterized is not being characterized in a way that is supportive of calls for transformative change. I also want to note that these narratives are not static. They are actually changing quite quickly. Um, and in particular, the leveraging the power of nature narrative, that pro and BS narrative is shifting and being influenced by this alternative narrative, by this dangerous distraction narrative, where we're starting to see a lot more acknowledgement and even agreement in some cases with the critiques 
and the concerns about the idea that is being um, put forward by the dangerous distraction narrative. So we're seeing some shifts. That said, the dangerous distraction narrative and the coalition of actors that's contributing to it are still very much present and are still shaping the discourse. Um, and I wanted to provide uh, this example of an addition to the narrative that was published quite recently. So this is a quote from the online magazine Atmos uh, in an article called The Problem with Nature-Based Solutions. Uh, this came out in May of this year, so only two months ago. And throughout the article, they quote and interview with a lot of Indigenous-led organizations across North America. Um, but I wanted to specifically highlight this quote, which reads, what we saw referred to as nature-based solutions was a co-option of Indigenous worldviews, but also a new strategy meant to facilitate the erasure of Indigenous-led movements, solutions, and demands necessary for us to continue to do what we're already doing well. So from my perspective, I think an important question for us, people, actors that are engaging with nature-based solutions as an idea, important question for us is to question whether or not this change that we're seeing in the narrative to acknowledge the critiques and concerns, whether or not this, these changes are substantive, meaning uh, are they actually going to address power asymmetries uh, or is it only a symbolic change? I wanted to quickly also highlight this other example of a recent addition to the discourse. Um, I worked on this last year in my capacity as a member of Youth for Nature with the Global Youth Biodiversity Network and with Youngo, two other big youth constituencies, uh, to put together a position statement from young people about nature-based solutions. Uh, and we ran this consultative multilingual survey we were able to collect the views of over a thousand youth from 118 countries about how young people are thinking about and understanding nature-based solutions. And what we found generally was one, there's a lot of excitement among young people about nature-based solutions, especially as an opportunity to address climate, biodiversity, and inequality in more interconnected ways. But there's also a lot of concerns. Um, and, and one particular concern that I wanted to highlight right now is that amongst youth, there's a perceived dominant NVS narrative that is overemphasizing carbon sequestration and offsetting, and in general, platforming and centering the wrong people, the wrong actors. And I wanted to highlight this specific quote from the position statement, which reads, big polluters continue to have privileged access and disproportionate leverage in the NVS discussion. I thought this was an interesting example, and of course I am biased, but I think it is an interesting example of how dominant narratives in the NBS discourse are reaching a group that currently isn't very, isn't really represented it, it represented in the NBS discussion more broadly, how it's reaching that specific group of young people and shaping our understanding of nature-based solutions and what its values are and what its concerns are. So that brings me to the last question. How can we maybe frame nature-based solutions as a concept in ways that better support calls for transformative change? Transformative change needs to occur at the roots, right? It requires major shifts in the underlying values and worldviews that shape our models of governance, our economies, and the ways that we relate to nature. That means that the ways that we communicate about nature-based solutions uh, need to also reflect this. Uh, and I would argue that we're not doing that right now. We're not communicating about nature-based solutions in a way that reflects shifts in our, our in our values and worldviews, major shifts. So there are a couple of ways forward that I wanna suggest. First, I think that actors that align themselves with that leveraging the power of nature narrative, actors that consider themselves pro-nature-based solutions, uh, especially actors that have access to decision making and access to power need to really meaningfully address the criticism that the dangerous distraction narrative and that coalition of actors presents, especially criticism that's coming from indigenous peoples and local community groups. One way to do that is to shift the way the private sector is being framed in the nature-based solutions conversation. Um, the private sector is often uh, framed as leaders, as, as innovators, um, as funders. Uh, and I would suggest that we need to shift that framing towards one that emphasizes responsibility 
and emphasizes accountability, especially when we're considering like large multinational corporations. I also uh, suggest that there needs to be a really clear and undeniable prioritization of the rights and leadership of Indigenous peoples and local communities. Uh, indigenous peoples and local communities are often highlighted as partners or as beneficiaries of nature-based solutions. Um, and I think this needs to shift towards a framing of Indigenous peoples and local communities as rights holders, as decision makers, and, and as leaders. Uh, and in doing so, there needs to be uh, uh, opportunities that are set up for uh, these groups to have meaningful and self-determined participation in nature-based solutions discussions where their contributions are platformed. Um, and in doing so, hopefully ensuring that nature based solutions, practices, policies, and outcomes uh, result in rights-based opportunities that counters the exploitative status quo. So to quickly wrap up, I want to zoom out a little bit um, and remember why this all matters. Uh, as we've heard already from um, a couple of the other speakers, nature-based solutions as an idea is gaining real momentum in policy and in practice. And this has really tangible on ground implications. Um, a, a local example for me, I'm Canadian. Uh, Canada has recently committed $4 billion domestically to nature-based solutions and has committed over 300 million internationally um, for nature-based solutions. And if the narratives surrounding nature-based solutions are replicating power imbalances, there is a good chance that the research and the policy and the practice that's coming from all of that funding may do that as well. Nature-based solutions as an idea has a lot of potential. Um, we've heard that from other speakers previous, uh, previously, and I would agree that there's a lot of potential for NBS to be a bridging idea that connects biodiversity and climate uh, policy and practice. Um, while also bringing in inequality and, and that social aspect, uh, but it's only gonna be able to do that if it's narratives shift. Because ultimately, if nature-based solutions isn't an inclusive idea, if it's not promoting collaboration, it's not going to be transformative and it can't be inclusive without addressing politics and power. Thanks so much everybody. Great, thank you, Marina. Are there any clarifying questions for Marina? Okay, if not, we're gonna to move to our next speaker who is going to be Helen Tugendat, who is Program Coordinator at the Forest Peoples Program, which is a human rights organization that works to create political space for indigenous and forest peoples to secure their rights, control their lands, and decide their own futures. Helen has worked for over 20 years providing policy advice to indigenous peoples and communities on conservation policy and practice from the 2003 World Parks Congress in Durban onwards and on the application of international human rights frameworks to defend local and national recognition of rights. She's particularly interested in supporting indigenous-led conservation initiatives based on secure tenure in addition to rights-based approaches. Welcome, Helen. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. How's everyone going? I'm aware we've been sitting here for a really long time. <laughs> um, anyone who would like to stand up and stretch and sit back down, you're very welcome to, because uh, I certainly appreciated the chance to stand up just then. Well done. There we go. Brilliant. I'm trying to make sure everyone's paying attention to my comments when we start. Um, okay. Um, I wanted to start by saying thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to, um, to be able to share some thoughts. Um, I'm going to be talking about, particularly about the importance of culture and rights in driving transformative change. So this is really quite well linked to the presentation that came before. Um, and I am going to centre quite a lot of what I say around the call for transformative change, because I think it's a really central part of the reason why nature-based solutions um, have come to the fore. The purpose of what I'm going to be sharing today is to share some of the concerns or issues or thoughts that have come up within our organisation 
when we're talking with indigenous people's organizations and communities uh, that we work with. And we work primarily around the forest belt. So I'm slightly reinforcing the tyranny of trees again um, with forest related nature based solutions in particular. Um, okay, I wanted to. Oh, just give me a second. Yes. So I wanted to start by pointing at the very large area of commonality and common thinking that's come up through every single presentation um, and comes up in conversations with community members around the world as well. And that is the need for transformative change. There's not much discussion that this isn't the right thing to be looking for. Um, the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, is calling for transformative change in the global biodiversity framework that we all sincerely hope will be in place and able to be implemented from the end of this year. The same phrase came out of the research of the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And I think that this is a really ambitious statement, transformative change towards just and sustainable societies and economies. I mean, this is a very big scale of change and there's not much disagreement in any of the stakeholders or the right holders that I talk to that that's not necessary. And as part of that, working within and with entwined ecosystems and systems of nature and people and supporting those systems to become more resilient, more climate resilient, to adapt to climate change as they happen and to sustain life better is clearly a positive step. So there's a huge area of agreement that sits at, at, the, at the basis for the reason um, why nature-based solutions um, have come to the fore, ecosystem services um, uh, before them. But what I'm going to be touching on first is some of the concerns that we hear. Um, and there's five that I've chosen. One of them's got quite a lot of airplay in the conference already, so I might not use, uh, spend as much time on it as I would have otherwise. The first one is lessons from Red Plus. Um, so Red Plus, for those who don't know that acronym yet, um, uh, reduced emissions from uh, de avoided deforestation and forest degradation. And this idea, this policy idea for reducing emissions has been around for a really long time. And it has a, quite a large number of policy frameworks, financial instruments that have been built around it. And its purpose is to build or to ready countries um, for voluntary carbon markets from reduced emissions. Um, however, it's been around for some time and the promise, promises that were made in the name of Red Plus when it first came haven't really been met. And in addition to that, we continue to hear and continue to see challenges about effective benefit sharing for Red, Red Plus projects on the ground. And we also see that Red Plus as a carbon trading uh, principle has created incentives for the, for the definition or the identification of carbon rights that are separate from other underlying asset classes like tenure rights and land rights. And this is a really complicated um, uh, idea to explain to communities and organisations that we work with. And when, when contracts are made to sell those uh, carbon rights in lands owned by people already, trying to explain what was sold is really complicated. And what, what is felt and what is experienced is a restriction on use and access rights for a reason that's not particularly clear. So we see that, we saw that emerge in red. And I think that's something that we need to, we need to learn the lessons that came up through that and apply them when, when thinking through how nature-based solutions may be main, mainstreamed or um, invested in more widely. This second point is the one I was going to spend quite a lot of time on, but people have been mentioning offsetting all day, so I'll do a little bit less. Um, I wanted to uh, put this quote up because there, there's some phrases in here which I don't hear very often when, when people talk about offsetting. So this quote is, offsets should only be used to compensate for the residual emissions that organizations cannot eliminate and not replace decarbonization efforts. So those words, residual emissions, that cannot be eliminated. That's a really high bar. So we hear the language about don't replace decarbonisation efforts. We hear that all the time. But we don't hear as much about the really high bar of what offsetting should mean in a, in a nature-based solution um, effort. Then the very last bit of the sentence, how to police this is as yet unclear. Um, there have been some efforts towards creating systems that might police it. But that, that quote from three years ago, I think, remains valid, valid today. 
Um, I won't say anything more about offsetting though. Uh, the third thing that I wanted to touch on is slippage through solutions that don't work. So afforestation is, is an example that has already been mentioned that in best case scenario can, can do some very effective work. But afforestation that doesn't work particularly well or conservation that is not sustained because of, um, because of uh, wild weather events. I'm Australian, so I feel quite strongly about bushfires and the increasing prevalence of bushfires. Um, if we're investing in nature-based solutions that are not, not, they either don't work or they don't work for a long time or they're lost in the face of wild weather, then we're looking at emissions that aren't reduced. And if those are the projects that are linked with offsetting, then you're losing on both ends of the, both ends of the equation. The other thing I wanted to just say quickly about slippage through solutions that don't hold up is um, there needs to be room for trial and error. So we need to be able to try projects that don't work. Um, and we can only do that if, this is, if it's not linked to offsetting. We can't do a trial and error approach if it's linked to offsetting emissions. Um, the fourth point that I wanted to make is the solutions that are being prioritised as we start to look at the emergence of nature-based solutions and financing being pushed towards nature-based solutions. Um, and to talk about this quickly, I just wanted to uh, refer to some research done in 2020 by the Rights and Resources Initiative. And they were looking at the in-kind and the financial investments made by Indigenous peoples, local communities and Afro-descendants in conservation. And they found that these groups make investments equal to a quarter of the global investment in conservation. If we look at the Global Protected Planet database, which shows who governs and who manages the world's protected areas and increasingly protected and conserved areas, it's only a tiny proportion are recognised as being managed or governed by Indigenous peoples and local communities. So we're not seeing a prioritisation yet. We're not seeing a recognition, a widespread recognition yet of uh, the work that Indigenous peoples and communities are doing and therefore investing in their solutions is not as widespread as it might be. The very last point, I'm talking quite fast because I'd like to get to the end and let people ask questions. Um, the very last concern area is about human rights violations and this links to a target that's already been mentioned twice today that uh, sits in the global biodiversity framework and that's the target of increasing the conservation areas of the world uh, to 30% of land and 30% of ocean by 2030 in about seven and a half years, so not a huge amount of time. The land area that's protected at the moment is just over 16%. So that's a very big increase, near double um, in a seven year period. And there's no doubt of the importance of increasing protection and conservation of the world's resources. But what matters is how that's done. And these decisions will be made fundamentally and primarily at a national level. And there are too many countries where the rights of communities and indigenous peoples aren't recognized. In some countries they are, but in too many countries they aren't. So as we th see the 30 by 30 target roll out, it, we are going to need to be incredibly careful and incredibly stringent about how financing goes into conservation to avoid displacement um, and evictions. Okay, so that's the end of the, uh, of the concerns. Um, and I, I, I do think it is really important that they're part of the conversation in the, in the uh, conference. So I'm very uh, pleased to have had the opportunity to share them with you. Um, I just wanted to quickly go down some key messages and um, I'm not going to read all of these out but I did want to start with rights to resources, rights to tenure, rights to land um, can enable the transformative change that I mentioned at the very beginning of this of my comments and indigenous tenure rights in particular need to be a part, they need to be recognised as part of the solutions not just something that needs to be not damaged. Um, Nature-based solutions that are situated on or impact on Indigenous territories need to be done with free prior and informed consent. This is an incre increasingly widespread um, acceptance to this principle. And also this third key point of nature and culture are intimately connected and solutions to our climate and biodiversity crises must harness both of these things, both nature and culture, which is why my comments are entitled culture and nature, uh, sorry, culture and rights-based solutions. I also wanted, just with this third key point, to point to a publication which um, Elizabeth Marema this morning mentioned the Global Biodiversity Outlooks, um, which is a fantastic publication of the convention. There's a companion publication which is published uh, together with the Global Biodiversity Outlook called Local Biodiversity Outlooks. 
and it's a, it's a companion publication that is written and authored by Indigenous researchers from around the world and it foregrounds local Indigenous positive solutions to, um, to, well, responses and contributions to each of the Aichi targets and the next one will we'll, um, do the same for the Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, so that's a great publication if you haven't had a look at it yet. And then the very last uh, few comments that I wanted to make. The first one I'm not really going to bother with because it's been said a lot and this is about offsetting having to be uh, residual and minimal in the equation. The, the second one I did want to say something about quickly. Financing for systemic change for biodiversity loss and climate change needs to also tackle unsustainable consumption and production. And this is something that our partners often say they feel is slipped out of the conversation. So behavioural change is necessary for them, but it's not necessary for, um, for northern countries that have, a, uh, have a, a, a larger history of consuming a larger amount of resources. Um, I think this is a really important uh, part of the wider conversation. And then finally, um, any target for expanding protected and conserved areas should have legally binding safeguards and mechanisms for oversight um, and accountability. And then the very last thing I should say is that this is a preview of session four tomorrow morning. So anybody who's interested in hearing more about these issues and particularly hearing about them from local community representatives and indigenous voices, um, session four tomorrow morning will give you that. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. Any clarifying questions for Helen? If not, we'll move to our last speaker on this panel who is joining us virtually, and that is Hank Niebuhr, who is director of EcoShape. Hank graduated as a civil engineer at the Technical University of Delft, after which he joined the Dutch engineering company, Witveen and Bos. There, he worked for 32 years as a geotechnical, coastal engineer, and port engineer, project manager for flood defenses and land reclamation works, head of business unit and member of the board of directors. His work experience includes countries such as Indonesia, Egypt, Kazakhstan, Latvia, Azerbaijan, Belgium, Germany, the UK, and others. Since 2015, he's been director of EcoShape, Building with Nature, director of the Netherlands Water Partnership, and member of the su supervisory board of Deltaris. So Hank, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for an excellent introduction. Um, yeah, also, I would like to compliment the organizers of this great event. Uh, it's really impressive that you can gather so many people around the theme of nature-based solutions, which deserves a compliment, in my opinion. Um, well, my presentation, uh, I'm afraid it will be back mostly to the first narrative, uh, as mentioned by uh, Marina. But you will see that there are aspects of the second narrative also. Um, I will give you an engineer's perspective on, uh, on nature-based solutions, uh, but I will start explaining what is building with nature. Um, I come from the hydraulic engineering sector in the Netherlands, and some 15 or 17 years ago, we realized that we needed to uh, transform uh, our solutions, the products that we produced, and also the way how we produce them. We needed better solutions for societal challenges, better solutions for shore protection, better solutions for urban expansion, better solutions for flood protection. And yeah, uh, of course, at that time uh, there was no, uh, there was no, there were no sustainable development goals. But nowadays, we would like to say um, that we need, with our solutions, to contribute to reaching the global goals within the planetary boundaries. That the solutions that we produce need to, to produce benefits across the SDGs. And we need to do that with, uh, with an eye on the planetary boundaries. And in our opinion, uh, we could uh, improve a lot by making nature part of the solution. And we were not alone in that, of course, because uh, almost at the same time, you could see uh, yeah, all these concepts uh, arising, working with nature, building with nature, nature-based solutions, ecosystem-based adaptation, nature-inclusive design. Well, I collected a few of the logos uh, 
on this slide. Um, well, nature-based solutions, uh, uh, I don't have to define it again, but what is building with nature then? Building with nature is the approach to create, implement, and upscale nature-based solutions for water-related infrastructure. And I put here a quote of my predecessor as the director of EcoShape, Professor Huib de Vriend. He said in 2015, the building with nature approach starts with understanding how the natural and societal systems function uh, by using natural materials for your solutions and use, make use of the uh, forces of nature and interactions in nature as much as possible by creating opportunities for nature to develop. Um, this concept needed to be developed and um, by initiative of the private sector in the Netherlands, we started an innovation program called Building with Nature, which is managed by the EcoShape Foundation. We investigated uh, the application of uh, Building with Nature solutions in six different landscapes, sandy coast, muddy coast, lowland lakes, ports, cities, rivers, and estuaries. And uh, we developed guidelines. We did that by realizing physical pilots. So we built building with nature solutions and uh, develop knowledge uh, by monitoring and measuring the performance of these solutions uh, and translate, translated what we learned into guidelines for replication. And these guidelines you can find on our website uh, if you want to um, yeah, if you want to design your own nature-based solutions, you can find a lot of tools and background information on our website. And this is an overview of the various pilot projects we worked on in four uh, thematic uh, areas, nature-based flood defenses, Delta cities, sustainable port development and ecosystem restoration. Uh, we realized, uh, yeah, uh, or we worked on the sand engine on the Delfland coast, uh, which is an iconic project in the Netherlands. Uh, we uh, realized a similar approach in, uh, in a muddy system, a mud engine. Uh, we developed artificial salt marshes as part of uh, flood protection. And we worked on uh, mangrove restoration in Indonesia. And well, how can I best uh, highlight an engineer's approach by uh, highlighting a project. Um, this, is, this is the project that, uh, yeah, turn, uh, that has developed into the flagship uh, project of uh, EcoShape. Uh, it was restore, it's about restoring coastlines in Indonesia. But this is an area where uh, since 2003, uh, the coastline has retreated by 1.5 kilometers at some places. And uh, this process uh, of uh, continuous erosion needed to be stopped uh, because in this area, a lot of people derive their livelihood uh, from aquaculture, shrimp farming, etc. People are living there. Um, so uh, we, uh, we came up with the concept to uh, capture sediments, uh, which were, there are lo a lot of fine sediments in the water in front of uh, this area. And uh, with, we try to capture these sediments with uh, low-tech structures uh, in such a way that mud flats uh, would develop. And these mud flats uh, are being re, um, recolonized by mangroves. And in these two pictures, you can see that it works. Uh, the the right-hand picture, uh, yeah, you see a mud flat behind a, a relatively simple structure, which can be built by local communities. And in the left-hand structure, you will see behind the second dam, uh, the most on, on, on the upper side of the picture, you can see an area being recolonized by uh, mangroves again. Um, in order to, to develop such a, uh, a project, you have to uh, analyze the system. Uh, so in this area, everything is connected, and sediment budget, longshore currents, the use of groundwater, land ownership, the ecological conditions, demography, demography governance, subsoil conditions, everything is interconnected. So we made a system analysis of that. Um, uh, here, uh, we, we analyzed the various ecosystems that you have there, the mangroves, seagrass, habitats, salt marshes, uh, 
and also analyze the various processes forming this coast, uh, sediment outflows, uh, uh, fresh water flows, uh, waves uh, were, are very important. And also, uh, we analyze the resource flows in the areas. So where is the sediment going? How can we trap it? How can it contribute to coastal resilience, to the development of mangroves? How are nutrient flows uh, very important for the aquacultures, which are very important for local communities to derive a livelihood on? And um, also, uh, yeah, we took a look at, uh, at the carbon flows. Um, to carry out such an extensive program, uh, we worked in a coastal stretch of 30 kilometers wide and seven, seven kilometers deep. You need a lot of stakeholders. You, you, uh, you need to bring together a lot of stakeholders. And in this program, EcoShape and Wetlands International together uh, as convening parties brought together all these stakeholders. Uh, first of all, uh, two ministries uh, in Indonesia, the Ministry of Marine Affairs, the Ministry of Public Works and Housing. Uh, uh, and also uh, local authorities, uh, the, the province of Central Java, this area is in, in North Java, by the way, uh, on the coast uh, near the city of Samara. And um, yeah, we, we started to work with local communities, uh, of course, it was quite difficult for us as uh, outsiders to, uh, to really reach them. So, uh, with the help of local NGOs, uh, we started teaching them how this whole system worked and how they could uh, yeah, uh, change some attitudes that they had or, or habits and turn these into uh, positive outcomes for themselves. Uh, so we learned them to build these low-tech dams and uh, to trap the sediments and let the mangroves uh, redevelop. Um, we did that in, uh, in coastal field schools, but we also engaged uh, uh, local, uh, local universities uh, because we needed to replicate this knowledge. It's very important also for the future maintenance of this area. So we engaged local universities, brought them together with international universities and knowledge institutes and developed courses for students. Uh, so that in Indonesia now there are several thousands of people who have gone through these courses and know about the concept of building with nature. Uh, what does it look like? Oh. Uh, we build these dams, uh, mud, uh, they result in mudflats. Mudflats are being recolonized by mangroves. That's not enough uh, because uh, at some places you have uh, very advanced aquacultures, uh, which are uh, a breach in the mangrove belt. We also negotiated with the uh, local farmers uh, to give back or to redevelop these uh, fish ponds into mangroves again and gave them some compensation for that. Um, also, behind the coastline, we brought back mangroves uh, because they fulfill very important functions. And we also found out that, that the aquacultures are more stable, more healthy, and they yield more, uh, they produce more if you make a mixed mangrove uh, aquaculture area. Uh, these mangroves uh, uh, in uh, behind the coastline, uh, they perform a lot of positive functions. Uh, they, they keep sediments in the area, they remove nutrients, they provide shading, etc. So uh, this open aquaculture area, uh, if you add mangroves to it, it becomes a much healthier and more stable uh, area. We also thought the local farmers to uh, use uh, sustainable aquaculture practices, ISO, low external input, sustainable aquaculture, no more artificial fertilizers, and also no more pesticides. And we found that the average shrimp yield went up three to 20 times, and the income of the local farmers was increased by three to nine times. And that is very important because one of the causes of the collapse of the mangroves of the coast was. Uh, yeah, the constant search for new fish ponds uh, to increase their income. And we taught them how to increase their income on, in the existing fish ponds, which uh, make, makes the need for additional fish ponds less. Um, well, what are the results? 
Now, this is a graph for a part of the area um, where you can see uh, we brought back mangroves uh, uh, in, inside, the, in, inside the fish ponds. And uh, um, the open dots uh, is the development of the uh, mangrove cover in this area, and the black dots is the development of the number of lift net installations. Uh, they, they are being used by local fishers to take out, uh, yeah, to catch fish. And you can see that uh, uh, the number of lift net installations increased rapidly after a few years, after uh, bringing back the mangroves, which is an indication that there is a lot more fish in the area. Um, we also made a social cost benefit analysis of this whole project. Um, well, this is the balance in the most favorable area, I must say. Uh, the coast zero, as we called it. Um, and uh, yeah, the total cost uh, that we in invested in this area uh, 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 to go to a mangrove-based economy uh, is about 5.4 million euros. And the total benefits uh, over uh, uh, a longer period uh, would amount to uh, 260 uh, million euros. There is, uh, if you look at uh, the benefits, uh, uh, you see that uh, the biggest benefits in, is in the increased uh, yield of the aquaculture and fisheries. Um, some uh, uh, positive effect is in the increase of biodiversity. But uh, there is a very large number in carbon sequestration. And well, you could say that's positive, but it also highlights the comments made by Matthias and uh, also by Marina and Beth uh, that this is also a bit dangerous, of course, because it also shows you that uh, yeah, there, there's a lot to be gained uh, by parties uh, uh, in this aspect of carbon sequestration. And it, uh, it tends to dominate uh, the other factors. But if you take it out as a positive uh, yield, uh, you can see that still uh, the project is very beneficial. There is one thing I have to say about this. There are, we divided this total cost in three different areas. I told you this is the most beneficial area. It is the area with the least land subsidence. If you get close to big cities uh, on the north coast of Java, there is a tremendous land subsidence which can be 10 centimeters per year. And we also found out that with these nature-based solutions, it's impossible to, uh, to protect your coast in a sustainable way by trapping these sediments. The, the land subsidence is too big uh, to be compensated by sedimentation. If you want to know more about it, we wrote a book on it. Um, it's, it's available to uh, the major book selling platforms. And, but you could also connect to our LinkedIn community. There's a LinkedIn group. Uh, you could follow us on, uh, on LinkedIn, uh, where we distribute news, uh, facts from projects, uh, development, and also events where we are involved in. And last but not least, I would like to give some credits to the, to the people that made pictures. Uh, thank you very much. This is what I had to present. Thanks very much to all of our presenters. So we have about 15 minutes for discussion. So while folks in the audience here in person are thinking about some questions they might want to ask of our panelists, we do have some online already. So I've got a question for Beth and Helen. Um, and that's about how local knowledge in decision making can be ensured in the context of strong dominance of formal governance structures. So are there any particular mechanisms that help give voice to local communities and stakeholders and make sure their voices are taken seriously? So any experiences that you both have with this? 
This is a, a very good question, a very challenging question. And I think the answer, I often say this in answer to questions, but it, it's very uh, national and site specific. So governance structures and, and the way decisions are made, the way that societies are organized are very um, sort of country and, and, and uh, context specific. One thing I would point to, which has been really powerful for a number of the organizations that we work with, is, the, is supporting the development of what, uh, what are often referred to as FPIC or decision making protocols for indigenous peoples where peoples and communities can take some time apart from any specific decision and can be supported with lawyers and other technical assistance to come up with a set of rules for engagement with companies or engagement with proponents for particular activities. Um, that this is particularly effective in places where collective governance structures are still quite strong. So we see a lot in Brazil, we see a lot in, in Colombia, we see a lot in Peru. They're not easy, but when they're invested in over a reasonable period of time, they can result in a decision-making structure that is um, somewhat independent. And so it provides a level of, of um, uh, an ability to come to a decision before an engagement is had with an external actor. Um, and I think they're, they're really powerful and they, they could be um, supported in more instances than they are. Yep. Um, yeah, that's, um, that's really nice. Yeah, a practical ex example that, that you've given. And I'm going to give a more um, abstract. Um, is the, again, this issue that um, we're not even necessarily there yet in terms of um, these governance structures recognizing the value of indigenous and local knowledge in the first place. Um, so that's like that's really one of the first steps is is that they need to recognize the value and they need to respect that value uh, because they're not going to listen. Like okay, the uh, the communities can provide their insights, but those aren't going to be translated if if we don't have those that enabling condition of of respect. Um, and, and recognition of the, the value. So I'll just, yeah, leave it at that. Great. Well, we've got a question which is somewhat related in terms of a follow-up. Um, and so this is a question that asks, you know, while communities and individuals um, are often mentioned in the context of NBS, there's often a focus on indigenous communities. Um, while not denying their importance, how can we make space for thinking about a whole host of communities that are often quite challenging and difficult to consider as having knowledge and values and experience of nature? but who also need to be harnessed. And so the question is around things like informal urban populations, communities being gentrified or displaced by NBS, small scale fishing and farming and so forth. Um, so does anybody wanna tackle this, the, the challenge of other communities as well? Folks online, feel free. Yeah. Marina, yes, please jump in. Yeah, I give a little bit of an answer in the chat to this and maybe I'll just speak it out loud for folks that are not online. Um, I th and I think this question sheds light to a super important aspect of nature based solutions, which is that it is and must be place based. Right. So I'm, I'm Canadian. So the role of indigenous communities in particular is incredibly important when we're thinking about nature based solutions in Canada. But this might not necessarily be the case for a country like the UK. Um, so I think when we talk about nature-based solutions in a global context, we tend to focus on indigenous peoples and local communities. And we're thinking about local communities that have been denied access to decision-making that whose values, whose knowledges are usually not incorporated um, because of their role and knowledges of global biodiversity hotspots, for example. But I mean, ultimately if nature-based solutions are to be successful, they need to bring in local communities of the place that they are occurring, which includes farming communities, which includes urban communities um, and the other communities that were listed. Um, so it's, I think it's sort of a half answer, <laughs> but I think, I think really the answer to that question lies in like a continuous reinforcement of nature-based solutions as place-based approaches um, that need to be designed and treated and understood as such in research and in policy. Great, thank you. I'd like to turn to the in-person audience and see if there's some questions here. So we've got a few hands up, maybe a mic here in the front. Thank you. I have a question about the role of the private sector. Does it work? Yes, okay. Hi, everyone. I have a role, uh, I have a question about the role of the private sector, because I hear a lot of concerns uh, about the focus on carb carbon offsetting and sequestration, 
Uh, um, uh, Marina told about uh, focus on responsibility. But what, in your perception, should be the responsibility and the role of the private sector in nature-based solutions? Okay. Anyone in particular you'd like to direct that to? Okay. All right. Any of our panelists want to take this on? Do you want to go? Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, you, you can. oh, sorry. Um, I, I think this is a. I think this is a really good question because the 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 term that's used in the global biodiversity framework is the sort of whole of society approach, and I um, I really agree with that term. I don't think that we get to where we need to be without um, everybody contributing, um, and that includes the private sector and all other all other actors in society. Um, I I think um, the the challenge the challenges that we hear about the engagement of the private sector in offsetting in particular is a it's a special bundle of 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 concern around the failure to change behavior because of the use of offsetting so that it's quite a, a specific critique and it doesn't it doesn't uh, step into saying the private sector should have no role at all i think i think that would be that would be a sort of an absurd continuation of 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 um of the concern um I, I do think in one of the first responsibilities of the private sector, and indeed every actor in society, is to address the fo footprint that you yourself bring. Um, so when companies are looking at particular projects, uh, supply chains are being managed in particular ways, uh, food systems are being designed in particular ways, and, and companies are participating in that food system, um, each company, each link in the chain needs to consider the footprint that they're engaged in and how they can reduce or manage, uh, manage that. So there is definitely a role, a very big role for the private sector. Yeah, yeah and maybe just to, to add to this, I mean, there's not the private sector, it's, it's a huge field of, of actors like civil society, like government, so you have different forms. And I see also from the biodiversity perspective, a lot of movement, um, business for nature, other initiatives who are really concerned that their value chains are negatively affected by biodiversity loss or loss of nature. So there's a huge consciousness and as Helen mentioned, the consumption and production side, and this is part of this new global biodiversity framework, there's a specific target on that as well, um, besides phasing out of um, harmful subsidies. So the consumption and production side, and I think um, Marina, you mentioned it in, in your input, and this is part of this transformative change. So the private sector definitely has a role. They're different private sector entities, they have to win and to lose, this is quite clear, but we also see it in our projects and in other countries when it comes to uh, deforestation free value chains, for instance, when it comes really to or the, 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 the fact um, process that was set up by the UK um, climate um, uh, conference and the presidency, I think these are very promising steps towards more sustainability and responsibility and this clearly goes beyond carbon. But I also think they can have uh, added value in nature-based solutions uh, for large-scale implementation with knowledge on technology and innovation and equipment. So, uh, yeah, I think that that can also be an opportunity without uh, uh, the, the responsibility to reduce the footprint at all uh, at all costs. Okay. I think we had some other hands. We've got a hand in back here in the middle. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Um, this is a question really about kind of getting the balance set between respect uh, and challenge and, and how transformative change sometimes needs needs the challenge element, you know, challenging cultural practices. Because, uh, and, and I, I admit this question is probably one that the so-called first world reads, needs to ask itself primarily, but I'll ask it anyway. You know, sometimes culture needs to change and, and the longevity of local traditions and how embedded they are is not proportional to the wisdom of their perpetuation. Um, I mean, a, an obvious example might be, you know, the practices of livestock agriculture in this country, for instance, they go back many centuries, and they're very, very deeply embedded in our culture. One only has to think about the, um, the Sunday roast, for instance. So yes, we need to respect local traditions, but equally, we need to challenge them. And how, how do we get that balance right? So how do we actually affect transformative change? That's, <laughs> that's, that's the big question. I think it's a fantastic one. Anybody want to take a stab? It, 
I'd, I'd just very quick, I'd, it's a very, very big uh, challenge. I, um, I guess I would say uh, something that we spend a bit of time thinking about is that culture is often considered to be quite static. Um, and this is a particular issue when, when um, working with indigenous communities and peoples where often outside influences will consider all aspects of culture to be incredibly static. And that's it's not the case. I mean, they are quite, uh, we all know this, we're all part of cultures in different ways. Um, and, and culture is fluid. So it's not, I, the only point I would make is it's not, it's not impossible you know, these, these, are, these are changes that we can affect. We just have to collectively decide on what our priorities will be. Um, it's not a very helpful answer, but it's, it's something. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, uh, yeah, to, to that point, like when we say traditional and in indigenous local knowledge, um, yeah, I, again, just as culture is not static, this knowledge is also not static. And, uh, you know, indigenous peoples have been navigating change for millennia. And so their, their knowledge is also not static and they are constantly um, evolving. And so, um, yeah, supporting traditions can doesn't mean like supporting the the same i i suppose and and yeah just to, to build on the the need for um these these dialogues uh yeah very very collaborative dialogues when when it's it's clear that things do need to to change but yeah um um yes please yeah i wanted to comment on this question because uh, many times when we talk about culture we refer to indigenous peoples and local communities, but we have to think about our own culture. And I think that here we have to review our own values because uh, that is extremely important. It's not just a matter of uh, changing our patterns of consumption and, and living, but we have to change our everything we are doing because uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very much related to and connected to the future of the planet. So I think we have to review our, uh, our thinking, our priorities, and we have to, to review all of that because it's, it's, it's a matter that is very much related to our daily life. No? So it's, it's, it's our values. What do we expect from life? No? What's our connection with nature? I think that there are philosophical questions that we need really to, to take. Great. There's one more question online that's related to this question of transformative change. And I think it's a great question to close out our session with. Um, so I'm going to ask each of our panelists to, in 30 seconds or less, um, consider this question. And that is, uh, most of the presentations on this panel have highlighted the importance of values in different respects, um, particularly in making NBS a positive force. So could each of the speakers very briefly share a question in your own work where you saw values making a difference, either recognition of values or some sort of support um, for inclusion of different values in, in BS on the ground. And does that get us towards transformative change? So Angela, shall I start with you? Well, uh, this is a, a great question. I was, for example, wondering about uh, the, the changes that we were expecting after the COVID situation. And I was really very optimistic that we were going to do things differently. But uh, surprisingly, it's not the case. I've seen that we are, as a culture and as a, so a society, we are really not ready to, to, to make the change. Perhaps, I, and we are trying to continue the same way we are doing things, uh, traveling, behaving the same way. The, the business and, and many kinds of organizations are, are, are continuing with the same kind of uh, activity. So I think we really, we really need to review everything that is happening because I think every time they, well, we don't have much time left to, to, to change things. And it's not just about climate change, it's about social justice, it's about inequalities, it's about everything. So I just wanted to, to highlight this. Thank you. Matthias, I'll turn to you. I think what we heard a lot in this panel, but not only in this panel, was the term social ecological systems. And you could even expand it to a, to a third dimension, social cultural ecological systems. And for me, 
um, about values, I think when I recall in a, in a previous project when I worked with, with um, colleagues in the Philippines and they were, and now I'm looking more to Hank, they were environmental engineers and they were really taking up this value about ecological systems into their, their thinking and they're currently also working on curricula and bring in really this environmental issues but also cultural values that people have into practice and for me this was quite inspirational and I just wish them that it will succeed not only in the Philippines but, but worldwide. About you. Um, yeah, so I, I guess like yeah, when also when you we, we talk about transformative change, we do talk about the need for that value change and as a society as a whole, that's true because we have you know we have disconnected from nature, and so that that value does need to change. Um, but transformative change also means um, like you know supporting values that are already there, um, the, the people that already have those values of, of the, the connection to nature. So transformative change doesn't just mean value change, it depends on um, the, the context. Uh, so that's sort of a, a more broader level, but then uh, sort of a more concrete example. Uh, I, I'll just go back to the example that I gave in my uh, talk um, uh, with this, this community forest uh, that um, initially local values weren't included in the, in the decision making and the forest was all just one species of pine. Um, but it was the, the local communities who actually expressed this, this, their, val their need for multiple species um, to address their different uh, uh, livelihood needs that actually led to that increase in, um, in species diversity, so that, and which made the forest resilient and making um, uh, nature decisions more resilient is, is part of that, that uh, transformative action point. So that's great. Marina, how about you? Yeah, um, so in my role at Youth for Nature, one of our biggest programs is our storytelling work. And the idea here is that we're collecting and amplifying the stories of young people who are doing work for nature and climate in their communities on the ground right now. Um, establishing young people as leaders, not just uh, in strikes on the streets, but also in the ground, in the mud, <laughs> in nature. Um, and I mean, I could select any one of the stories uh, that we receive and share about how uh, young youth-led work is implementing different values to, to make maybe a bigger difference in nature-based solutions on the ground. But something that we see a lot is um, young people that are doing this work, leading for restoration, agroforestry work, uh, large-scale conservation campaigns, um, there's key values of sustainable and regenerative livelihoods, um, of justice, and of intergenerational community. Uh, young people want to do this work in nature and in climate. They want to be leading in, in, in NDS and they want careers and livelihoods that are going to be regenerative um, for themselves uh, and for their intergenerational communities. Uh, and when this work is supported, which is some of the work that Youth for Nature is trying to do is support this work more broadly. Um, we just see bigger ripple effects of more young people coming in and wanting to get involved in this kind of work on the ground. Um, so I think that's really important when we're thinking about how we're gonna scale up a lot of this work and who the sort of leaders of that scale of young work is going to be in 20 and 30 years. Great, thank you. Helen, a last thought on values and transformative change? Um, uh, yeah, so a practical example um, that we, we have a project um, that we're doing in five countries at the moment, which is a biodiversity monitoring project. Um, and we had a, a long conversation um, with the funder before we sort of started thinking about the project. And uh, it's it, it all of the biodiversity indicators are being created by the communities who are doing the the monitoring um, and the diversity of the indicators is extraordinary so there's they started with cultural indicators moved on to linguistic indicators moved into biodiversity indicators and they they now have these systems of, of measurement um, which will in time go into the nbsaps and into the cbd once we have a gbf um, but looking at the difference of the indicators um, from a more standard biodiversity health indicator set um, was fascinating um, and Hank, last thoughts from you on values and transformative change. Well, it definitely won't be my last thought on that topic, but uh, I will share you my present thought. Um, what I think that we need, uh, if we want to change values, we need to, to create showcases. Eh? So we need to be able to demonstrate to people what uh, nature-based solutions can bring to society. And, but if we really want to 
uh, influence values, we also need uh, to work together. Huh? So uh, with people from science policy world, NGOs and the private sector, um, let's uh, join forces and create uh, these examples. That would be my... Uh, a wonderful note to close on. So thank you to all of the panelists for participating.